Good evening, everyone. My name is Ritu, and on behalf of G5A, I'm very excited to welcome you for Serotonergic Psychedelics Mushroom for Discussion, an Infosys Prize lecture by Professor Vidita Vedya, co-hosted by Infosys Science Foundation and G5A. Infosys Prize endeavors to elevate the prestige of science and research in India and inspire young Indians to choose a vocation in research. The award is given annually to honor outstanding achievements of contemporary researchers and scientists across six prize categories, engineering and computer science, humanities, life sciences, mathematical sciences, physical sciences, and social sciences. Professor Vidita Vedya will explore the recent resurgence of interest in serotonergic psychedelics and what they can teach us about brain function and how modern researchers can take a leaf from the profound respect that indigenous practitioners have accord accorded these compounds. I would also like to introduce Priyanka Shah, who has a master's in counseling psychology from the UK and is a licensed professional counselor from Washington, DC. She also heads Align Mental Health Services in Mumbai. She is deeply committed to creating safe and compassionate spaces for individuals going through life transitions. I would like to request Priyanka to please come on stage after the talk. Before we begin, I would like to share a few house rules. No food or beverage, including water, is permitted inside the black box. If you have any of these items, please pass them on to someone from our team. There are three exits to the black box, one that you came in from, one directly opposite it, and one to your right. And most importantly, I'd like to request you to please take a moment now to put your devices on silent or turn them off entirely. I'll wait. Thank you. In first, let me say this is just a huge honor to be giving the Infosys Prize lecture, and in particular to be giving it at this magical space, G5A. So thank you so much, Anuradha. This is a remarkable um, space that is an ode to some of the best cultural practices of Mumbai. Uh, we need more of these spaces where we have the possibility of interesting dialogue between citizens who are just interested in many aspects that are of relevance to humanity. Those spaces are shrinking in our country. And at a time like this, I think um, something of this nature, like G5A, deserves a full-fledged applause. So um, diving in, let's um, take a little bit of a journey and tell you that if you had um, been having an auditory hallucination, it might actually have sounded like what you just heard, which is uh, overlapping sounds, um, lack of coherent noise or voice that had clarity. So it's actually really interesting that we, <laughs> we had that happen right at the beginning. Um, let me just see if I can do this Yeah, from here. Okay, so let me start by asking this audience, I can't really see you, you can see me, but I'm gonna ask for a, a show of hands to ask if anyone in this room thinks that they consumed a psychoactive substance today. And I'm curious to see if anyone would self-proclaim that they actually consumed something psychoactive today. So if I have a show of hands from the house, just to get a sense of anyone believing whether they consumed anything psychoactive today. I see a hand up there. So as one brave soul who's decided that they will declare that they consumed something psychoactive, I'm telling you that it's a very strong possibility most of you consumed something psychoactive. Anyone have any of these two beverages anytime today? Okay, so then we know that pretty much close to all, probably 80% of this audience has consumed something psychoactive. Um, anyone have any um, ruined cheese? I mean, this is probably high caliber cheese. I'm calling it ruined cheese because it has fungus growing on it. But if you had any high caliber, high quality aged cheese, you might have also had substances that can evoke psychedelic like experiences. Um, so can poppy seeds, so can nutmeg. So. Caffeine is the most commonly used psycho psychoactive substance that is used world over, right? But my favorite psychoactive is actually on this page. Chocolate is something we all consume and we don't consider it a psychoactive. So the reality is for as long as people have walked this planet, people have consumed psychoactives. It's just 
part of our existence. We eat many and drink many psychoactives quite routinely. Most of them have relatively mild effects, but those of you who have a particularly strong cup of coffee, don't be surprised if you get withdrawal symptoms when you don't have it for a period of time. So you know that um, your body does get dependent on things like caffeine, and caffeine is a potent stimul a stimulant to the brain. But let's take a little bit of a walk down history, shall we? Shall we go back and dive back into the earliest expected reports of the use of psychedelics? How far back does this actually go? And let's take a little bit of a journey. So psychedelics, as we understand them, I'll have to define that term. Psychedelics are those that alter perception and our understanding of reality. Um, serotonergic psychedelics are a subset of psychedelics that actually target the serotonergic receptors in the serotonin system. And what is serotonin? It's a neurotransmitter in your brain. So we've had molecules that are derived from lots of plant-derived substances, the peyote cactus, for one example. Mescaline is the molecule in there. That's psilocybin from this mushroom family. Ayahuasca, which is a brewed tea that is used in ceremonial for ceremonial purposes across large parts of South America. And so usage has been around for a long time. This is a source from the Visual Capitalist that has a nice historical preview of how long have these molecules been used. Actually, there's a really interesting history here. Some of the proponents of the altered states of consciousness actually think that cave art originally emerged as a consequence of the consumption of psychedelics. And this is, of course, conjecture. And it's hard to actually prove whether this is true or not, because how do you, you know, even archaeologically figure this out in terms of consumption that might have happened thousands and thousands of years ago? This, for example, is a mural for, from 4000 BC in a cave in Spain. And obviously, this will tell you that already by this time, and certainly we know that about 12,000 years ago is when we expect agrarian communities to have come up where people were settling down near some waterfront and you know domesticating animals and then growing their own grain. So we knew that we would have expected to see creatures like this because of course domestication of animals and then pulling animals together, being able to generate dairy, etc., would have started. But what are these spindly-like objects down here? Now, you can say this is a bit of a stretch and an imagination. But when you zoom in on them, they look remarkably like a series of mushrooms. Now, of course, that's a little difficult to say. One is guessing. But these are, of course, debates that people have had. This is from 9000 BC. And this is a medicine man from cave art in Algeria. And you can see that what look like mushrooms in the hands, which suggest indigenous usage by medicine men of molecules derived from these very interesting plants. But what probably is the most interesting aspect is that you have things in cave art which probably do not exist anywhere on the planet. Obviously, someone in their own interpretation of this might imagine this is an alien invasion. Because, I mean, in principle, it's unlikely that there has ever been a creature floating around like this. But you see these fantastical images that are drawn in cave art and that begs the question as to whether there might have been exposure to serotonergic psychedelics or other psychedelics at that time, which might have led to drawings of this nature that show up in Keva. Obviously still conjecture. But what's interesting is this is a common visual theme that emerges across time in many artists who have been under the influence of psychedelics. So here, for example, is art from 1938, where we know there was a likely consumption of psychedelic-like molecules. What is remarkable is there is similar visual imagery. And there are certain common signatures to how you have visual hallucinations associated with these molecules. Um, just like we had a, a, you know, a technical glitch, which we imagined was an auditory hallucination, we can also say that there might have been imagery that came associated with consumption. And this has led to ideas which are rather intriguing. There's actually an entire theory that uh, sort of posits that there was an altered state of consciousness model to rock art. And that prehistoric making of images in caves and rock art might actually have contributed to the emergence of cave art. This, of course, remains conjecture until you have some proof. 
And this is really an interesting experiment that came out in PNAS in 2020, which is perhaps our first beginnings of proof from a combination of archaeologists, chemists, neuroscientists, cultural anthropologists coming together. So what you have here is a cave called the Pinwheel Cave, okay? And it's in California. And in the Pinwheel Cave, there are these pinwheel-like drawings on the cave um, roof. And there are several of them. And here's just one zoomed-in image. And you can see that this looks like a very clear pinwheel, which is why the whole cave is also called the Pinwheel Cave. This remarkably looks like the Dhatura dried up plant. Everybody know Dhatura? I imagine that most people have seen this purple flower hanging around like a weed that grows randomly all over India. There are many places where you would see it. And perhaps if you were the sort that explored and took down these flowers and then potentially were worried about consumption, somebody might have told you they're really toxic and highly poisonous. So you might have heard about the Dhatura flower. So this is the Dhatura quid. And what was really interesting in the study is that you had archaeologists and cultural anthropologists pull out all these things that were stuck to the roof of this cave. And in the roof, they were what looked like tobacco that had been chewed and then just simply stuck wherever. Okay? So we are guessing that, that, that these were chewed up. But what you can actually do is pull out these squids and look at whether you can see mastication-like marks on those squids. And you can actually find the shape and architecture of tooth marks that would have been made from repeated chewing and then taking it out and sticking it. But what's very interesting is then you can bring in high-end chemistry. Nothing stops you from taking stuff that was chewed several hundreds and hundreds of years ago and running it through a mass spectrometer to ask what are the molecules in this stuff that is chewed and stuck in this cave. And when you do that, you find very, very interesting molecules like scopolamine. Scopolamine is a very potent psychedelic. We know this now because obviously we understand this molecule and what it does to the brain, and we know it is a very potent psychedelic. But this then is our hint to the idea that cultures and civilizations, long before they knew that scopolamine is a molecule that changes the brain, were using these molecules to access perceptual and altered realities quite uh, routinely, perhaps, across multiple civilizations. We know this, of course, from largely Mexico, Middle America, Incan civilizations, the Amazon, Peru, Chile, these regions of the world. And you can see, for example, here, these, this is um, actually a um, statue which depicts the Aztec god of flowers and dance. And you can actually see that associated with this is morning glory, which also contains an interesting psychedelic. There are mushrooms that decorate this uh, individual, the god's eye, uh, ears as earrings, etc. And these are called entheogenic plants. And the term entheogen refers to the idea that it alters perception, mood, consciousness, cognition, behavior potentially allowing you to access spaces which you would not otherwise be able to access with ease in the absence of the pharmacological agent. And here are, in Guatemala, these are Mayan mushrooms, and this is actually a mural that depicts, you know, the god, Talok, and these are considered flesh of the gods, okay? So this is, indigenous practices have been using these for thousands of years. This was routine indigenous practice. And yet, they did it in a very controlled manner with a manner in which they considered it sacrament. Sacrament which suggested this came to you as flesh of the gods, and so there was a requirement to really treat it with the profound respect that these molecules allow you to in terms of what they allow you to access in terms of spaces. So that was a very interesting indigenous usage. There is, of course, a complete change in our era, and that itself uh, raises all kinds of interesting concerns. Here is the popularly known Ayahuasca tea. It's also fascinating that the shamans who were in the Amazonian forest managed to, amongst the most rich biodiversity hotspot, one of the most rich biodiversity hotspots, managed to put together a cocktail of these two plants, which allows you to have large concentrations of dimethyltryptamine, which doesn't get broken down because you prevent it from being break broken down by other molecules that come in like harmine and harmaline. And why am I saying this? DMT is a very potent psychedelic. You, me, all of us in this room, every multiple animals, lots of plants, all have DMT. So you and I are walking around with a Schedule One compound in our body. Why are we not all having a hallucination? Of course, we have an 
interpretation of an agreed reality, which we both or all of us agree to is the world, that is an agreed concept of reality, right? We've agreed that this is what we collectively all see. That may not always be the case for everyone. But bottom line, why are we not having, if we have so much DMT in our body, why are we not all experiencing altered states of reality? The reality is that we all hallucinate and we don't really know how much we hallucinate. Okay, we don't have that knowledge. We're unaware of what is a hallucination versus what is reality in that sense. And that opens up very, very interesting questions about the possibility that hallucinations are not as rare as we think they might be. So we do have DMT, but most of the DMT is broken down in your gut. Most of it is not making it into your brain. And it's just getting broken down and digested and out of your body. So your brain is not really being accessed by those molecules. But if you prevent it from being broken down by drugs that actually, molecules that actually prevent the enzyme that breaks down this molecule, you'll just have enough that actually accesses your brain. And that's what this combination T allows to happen. And that opens up very interesting questions. It actually opens up the interesting debate of the fact that a molecule like DMT is Schedule One which means it is identified as a drug of abuse, and you would not be able to cross national or international boundaries carrying this molecule because it is a Schedule One drug of abuse, and yet you have profound amounts of DMT inside your body. So are you contraband? It opens up the fundamental question, right? Because you do have it in your body. So now how do we navigate something of this nature? Because this opens up very, very interesting questions in terms of what we think about these molecules as well. Uh, we knew also from early indigenous practitioners that this was not consumed in a casual manner. It was consumed with an understanding that set and setting matters profoundly. And while that has been rediscovered again in modern era by psychotherapists and psych psychiatrists, the awareness that molecules and the way they influence the brain is not just the molecule and the individual, but also the environment, the set and the setting, this was already understood by uh, indigenous practitioners a long time ago. Let's go back then to ask, was this only sort of South America, Middle America, Mexico? Was there other usage? What about India? I mean, we have our famed Somras. What is the molecules in that uh, you know, what is it? What are those molecules? We don't know. We definitely have plenty of molecules used in traditional Indian medicine that are reported to evoke hallucinations as side effects. That opens up the possibility that there has been consumption in India as well. Um, cannabis has, of course, been used in the country routinely for a very long time in indigenous practices, but again, in a ceremonial manner and with a restricted usage under controlled festival associated events, not for routine and uh, you know, uncontrolled usage. So it's interesting how cultures before the banning happened responsibly handled molecules. So that opens up itself an interesting debate. But let's go back to this. What about Greek, uh, you know, Greek and Roman civilizations? And this then is a really interesting question. So the entire myth of Persephone and Demeter and Persephone being taken away by Hades to hell as his, as his wife and then Demeter searching for Persephone. There is an entire uh, cult, an agrarian cult that grew around this, which is about fifth to fourth century BC. Plato was part of the initiates of this cult. So to give you a sense, it was a big deal to be asked to participate in what were called the Eleusinian Mysteries, which happened just north of Athens. And one of the mysteries that you consumed was grain. Now, why am I saying grain is interesting? Grain is interesting because we've been, we have a long lasting relationship with grain. That is what our agrarian communities did. From 12,000 to 13,000 years ago, we've been trying to grow grain and eat it, obviously. And also we know what happens in cities like Mumbai to your bread. I don't have to tell you. Most of you have thrown out bread which has fungus on it. Everybody here knows what bread looks like with fungus on it. You can't live in a city like Mumbai with this level of humidity and not have seen fungus growing on bread, right? Bottom line, grain is a perfect target for fungus to grow on. And why does this matter? because the barley drink was one of the Eleusinian great mysteries which was consumed. And there is a debate about whether that drink ended up containing ergot fungus as part of the barley, and that contains very potent psychedelics and is considered to give a complete altered perception of reality. It is also interesting that that might have links to the birth of Christianity 
And I'd certainly suggest that someone interested in that idea might want to read Brian Murarescu because this is an interesting treatise on the immortality key. So the idea is that civilizations over and over again have rediscovered this, have been curious about it, and have actually you know, explored these molecules. So if you look at it here, the ethnobotany of psychoactive plant usage, look at hallucinogens and look at Native American cultures. That's where it was most routinely used, but it's not to say it hasn't been used elsewhere. And just to give you a sense, these are all plant-derived molecules that have similar effects of this nature and have been used across civilizations. All right, so then where did we go from all this long, long, long era in which it was used fairly responsibly is what we guess with within sort of Ceremonial usage, indigenous usage, usage that required purification, limited access, altered the manner in which the dosing was done. A lot of this was being done. What happened then after that, right? Well, you have to think about what happened in this window in this part of the world. And that's when we come to colonial history. We come to colonial history and, and you look at all of these regions which are going to get invaded by Spain and the spread of of missionaries and, and the Catholic Church. And the biggest risk then was peyote, because this was part of Mexican traditional practice. Peyote is the cactus that contains the molecule mescaline. Mescaline is a serotonergic psychedelic. And here is the first known ban we know, at least that we know of, of that legally banned the use with a clear saying that this is considered heretical against the church. And if you just read it, you can see that the Spanish obviously, through their missionaries, were opposed to the practice of the use of, uh, of this by the Aztecs. And not so much on account of its physiological effects, because these molecules perhaps may not have had as severe or dangerous physiological effects, but because of its perceived religious significance and the idea that it was viewed as eating um, human flesh partly because it gave you altered perception of reality. This is actually the official ban translated into English, but it'll give you a sense. We, the inquisitors, against heretical perversity and apostasy in the city of Mexico, et cetera, et cetera, ban the use of this molecule. And if it is used, we, the person is put to death, okay? So this is what was the first ban. But the perhaps more interesting anecdotal evidence we have, which people speculate, is the Salem witch trial. The so Salem had a very, very wet winter, and the women who were doing, so this is patriarchy, right? You, the women who were actually making the wheat were grinding barley and rye, and this is what the fungus actually looks like. This, this, these molecules here, that's ergot fungus on rye, that's ergot. So if you access this, the likely exposure to ergot-like molecules, which several of which can have psychedelic-like effects, is very high. No wonder there was then the po possibility, sorry, let me just go back. No wonder then there was a possibility that people had hallucinations and they saw visions and they saw totally altered sense of the world and they were then labeled witches and burned at the stake. So it is interesting to think about how we have navigated this in both interesting, responsible ways, but also in equally problematic ways in terms of how we've tackled these molecules. But what about this period of time? Like, let's bring it into some, something that's within more recent history. Where does this actually start? So we need to start in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Can you hear me? Uh, did, did you lose me on the mic, or can you hear me still? OK. Um, all right, uh, well, maybe it's just this particular image. Let's, let's carry on. Okay, um, these are the molecules. You might not be interested in them too much, but these are the, the actual molecules within these compounds that exert the effects on the brain. And just to give you a sense, you have naturally occurring psychedelic substances like ayahuasca, DMT, which you have also in your own body, mescaline from peyote cactus, ibogaine from the iboga plant, psilocybin from mushrooms, but you also have synthesized molecules like ketamine, MDMA, LSD. LSD is a serotonergic psychedelic. MDMA, while it 
does behave in many ways like serotonergic and hit serotonergic pathways. It, it's debated whether it's called a serotonergic psychedelic in a classical sense. And ketamine is a psychedelic, but not a serotonergic psychedelic. And so these molecules are rather interesting. Some of them are natural, some of them are synthesized, but here's the brief timeline of the history. So the earliest reports are isolation and identification of mescaline, and this is happening around about 1897. But the big event, the big event is this. The big event is actually, um, is Albert Hoffman, who's a um, synthetic chemist at Sandoz, who decides at that point in time that he's going to synthesize potentially antibiotics. Remember the era, remember the time, this is the 1930s, 1940s. He's trying to make it from fungus, not very surprising. Those of you who remember your 10th standard biology may remember penicillin and the discovery of penicillin from fungus. So antibiotics do come from fungus. And so in principle, it's not a bad idea to try to find an antibiotic from a fungus. But he didn't make an effective antibiotic. What he ended up synthesizing was LSD. It didn't kill any, uh, any bacteria, and so he thought it was an utterly useless drug, and so he stuck it on a shelf and forgot about it for four years. In that era and time, it was not considered irresponsible behavior to potentially try the molecules you had synthesized as long as you knew that they were not severely toxic. So he decided one day in 1943 to try a very low dose, what he thought was a very low dose of LSD. He ended up consuming what would be considered a very high dose of LSD because LSD is remarkably potent and requires extremely low concentrations to have strong effects. He thought he was dying. He asked his assistant to get him home. He was on the bicycle, he headed home. He called the doctor because he was literally consi you know, considering that he was on his deathbed. And then he, like a scientist would do, wrote down everything that he experienced. Yeah, it's rather interesting that, that that was what he chose to do at that point in time. So he, he wrote everything down. That day is now commemorated as the bicycle day because it describes him going home on his bicycle with this entire event. Turns out it didn't have physiological effects where his heart rate was normal, his blood pressure stayed okay, but he had a full-fledged altered state of reality, including dissolution of self. And that is can be pretty scary. So I'm sure he was scared out of his mind. So then what happens after that? Now, th what happens after that is that obviously people who study the brain and neuroscientists and pharmacologists and neuropsychopharmacologists, I would consider myself a neuropsychopharmacologist, are deeply interested and were interested in looking at these molecules, synthesizing them, studying them, but then they emerged on the street. They emerged on a street in a manner that was perhaps uncontrolled and in a manner in which they were abused. And they were, they were not the only drugs abused. There were many other drugs being abused at that time. And that window between 1960 to 1970 is a window in which a lot of drugs were indeed abused. But it's also an interesting time from the point of view of the war machine and the idea that these molecules, especially psychedelics, often um, evoke pro-social behavior and are less likely to evoke aggressive behavior. There are drugs like PCP that can evoke extremely strong aggressive behavior, but these molecules are not likely to drive aggressive behavior up at all. It is interesting that associated with that, that there were you know, drop acid, not bombs. Uh, national boundaries sort of become a little irrelevant when you are not thinking of self and non-self as a relevant construct at all. The idea of an imaginary line in the ground that divides you from your neighbor seems completely irrelevant when there is not a division between self and non-self, and which is what some of these molecules can evoke and induce. So then, then what happens? Well, this is a quote from Michael Pollan's book. I'd recommend it to those of you who'd like to read it. It's called How to Change Your Mind. It's a very nice dive into the history of serotonergic psychedelics. Those of you who have decided they don't like to read and want to watch the Netflix documentary can watch a four episode uh, documentary on it instead in case you don't want to read the book. I'll actually recommend reading the book. It's, a, it's an interesting read. And here's from his book, a quote, which I really like. So I'm gonna read it out to you. Midway through the 20th century, two unusual new molecules, organic compounds with a striking family resemblance, he's talking about these molecules, this is natural, this is synthesized, um, exploded upon the West. And it is true, it only exploded really on the West. It had been used in other civilizations for a lot longer without the crisis that it evoked in the West. 
In the time, they would change the course of social, political, and cultural history, as well as the personal histories of the millions of people who would eventually introduce them to their brains. As it happened, the arrival of these disruptive chemistries coincide, coincided with another world historical explosion, that of the atomic bomb. There were people who compared the two events and made much of the cosmic synchro synchronicity. Extraordinary new energies had been loosed upon the world. Things would never be quite the same. And in that sense, it's really interesting what humanity chose to ban. We chose to ban this and not this. So it is rather interesting in terms of damage to humanity, which one humanity chose to take a call to take out, right? So we chose to say this is OK, but this we will not even allow research on. And it is scheduled one, and we will ban it. And so it is interesting, because it tells you about the war machine and the interests of of driving the conceptual idea of nationhood, which is associated very tightly with the war machine. And what happens when you have major business interests associated with the war machine and political interests associated with that. The idea of nationhood, by the way, is recent in humanity and history. It's a really recent idea. And boundaries have been loose and flowed around all, all across time and history. And yet we are now wedded to ideas of imaginary lines that are drawn in sand enough to be able to lose human life over it. So that is interesting in, in its, itself. So what do psychedelics actually do to the brain? Well, they do many interesting things. They also do many scary things, which is why we do need legislation and we need a sensible approach to how we look at these molecules. They are associated with ego dissolution. They are often associated with mystical experiences. They are associated with altered perception and hallucinations. Very strong altered perceptions and hallucinations can be dangerous because bad trips can be associated with profoundly dangerous circumstances that individuals find themselves in as well. So there is that. They also reduce this network, the default mode network connectivity in the brain. So what is the default mode network? So sitting here in this room are all these people who are listening to me, I hope. And some of them are paying super fine attention. Some of them are thinking about the fact that, oh, I forgot to you know, leave. Um, uh, maybe I didn't shut my window properly. Or I hope uh, that the laundry has been done. Or uh, whatever, right? You're thinking about something. Or you're ruminating about how you feel about something. If you're ruminating and you've switched off, then it's likely that your default mode network has gone into just functioning. It's what happens when you're just pretty much sitting and staring out and not really thinking about anything, but it is self-referential. More often than not, the de default mode rec network is what actually is associated with self-reflection, self-awareness, rumination. These are all conditions that are greatly enhanced in certain psychiatric disorders, anxiety and depression being two major examples. Because the world and circumstances all become self-referential in a sense. What psychedelics do? is they reduce default mode network connectivity and allow for a resetting so that you can rethink about the way, in some sense, you think about yourself. So it's very interesting molecules. And why would someone like me, who is a neuropsychopharmacologist who works with rats and mice, be remotely interested in these molecules? Well, they work on my favorite receptor. And I've been studying this receptor for a long time. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the work, but I will mostly give you a sense of the broad sense of where this field is going. All right, so if we looked at what happened, suppose we were to do a search on papers published on this molecules. OK, here's DMT, here's ayahuasca, here's psilocybin. You can see that somewhere around here, everybody got really excited. And lots of people were studying it. And LSD, lots of people were studying it. And then it gets banned. And it gets banned, and nobody studies it. Nobody was studying ayahuasca because no one had even paid attention to it. They didn't care. It was something happening with shamans in indigenous ceremonies in you know, South America. This was not something the West had woken up to at all. Now it's like uh, really turned topsy-turvy. It's a worry because it's a, it, it, it lacks the respect that indigenous practitioners sometimes provide to an understanding of potent molecules like this. So here's an interest, resurgence of interest in ayahuasca. Here is the molecule I study in my lab, DOI, which was synthesized by Alexander Shulgin, which has been used much more recently. It's a synthetic molecule. Here's psilocybin studied and then stopped. Okay, And then resurgence of interest. So what's happening here? What's going on in this last few years? Why is this thing climbing upwards? And I promise you it will continue to climb upwards. Why is there this big resurgence of interest? This is just the number of clinical trials in the US, and it's only updated till 2019. Look at the number. 
of clinical trials going up with these molecules. So these molecules are being rediscovered. It's not like they didn't exist. It's just that the field of psychiatry, psychoanalysis is rediscovering them in terms of beginning to appreciate the potent power of these molecules. So when did that start? It, 2017 is sort of when it started. And how did it start? How did anybody take a Schedule One drug like MDMA, which is known as ecstasy in popular parlance, how did it ever end up in a clinical trial? Well, it ended up in a clinical trial because it was actually given to patients who had terminal diagnosis and who had uh, anxiety and depression associated with that terminal life diagnosis. Because it was a terminal diagnosis, it was allowed to be used as experimental therapy. And MDMA led to a profound reduction in the anxiety, despair, trauma associated with end of life. And that was why originally it was given breakthrough therapy status by the FDA in the US, opening the window to the possibility that these molecules will enter into clinical trials for other disorders. So the idea that it will be used for post severe post-traumatic stress disorder that um, does not respond to available pharmacotherapy generalized anxiety disorder, substance abuse, obsessive compulsive disorder, treatment resistant major depression. This is where it is now entering. And what you will see over a period of time is that it is really entered in a major way. That this is, this is actually a little bit old. So this is you know a while back. There's a 285 active or completed psychedelic trials recorded around the world. Where in the world? In the West? largely, um, it's still allowed in indigenous practices in, in, uh, in countries like Brazil or Peru or Chile in any case. And that has a very different manner in which it's being used. But keep in mind that there has also been abuse of those practices in a manner when you have, um, you have in sort of a arrival of tourists who seek it without the practices that the indigenous people used. Um, now, currently, it's being used in a variety of therapeutic trials. And one imagines that in the next five to 10 years, this will expand. Where is India on this map? India currently definitely allows ketamine usage, but not none of the other Schedule One compounds are in clinical trials in India. So we don't have an indigenous local cultural understanding of how we will navigate the space that is going to open up in the next 15 to 20 years. It is inevitable it will open up. It will require legislation. It will require responsible and mature approaches to how one legislates these molecules and how they will be used, who will use them, what kind of doses, what is the local context. It requires a lot of work. And if you don't do the work, you're going to be playing a catch up game without a real understanding with a worry that you do something that perhaps may not be the most appropriate and sensible steps in dealing with these highly potent molecules. So here are the molecules. Here's psilocybin. These are the phenylethylamines. I work with these, these molecules, DOI, TCB2, uh, NMOM. These are the molecules we use in my lab. They're synthetic serotonergic psychedelics, which are not Schedule One compounds, which is how we access them in Mumbai, can order them from Sigma, which makes them and synthesizes them. And they're used in experiments in our lab. As far as I know, I can't think of too many other preclinical researchers in the country that work with psychedelics. We cannot access psilocybin or psilocin or psilocybin Sabine can't access LSD. It has taken us five years to get the narcotics clearance to work with psilocybin in one set of experiments in Nimhans to be able to do this through the legal route. And that just tells you the challenges for people entering this field. It's not an easy space because it's not easy to get the required clearances to do this work. All right, so what do we actually do? Here's what we do in the lab. Here's the molecule we use. This is the molecule DOI. We work with rats and mice. We are interested in how these molecules shape circuits in the brain. We look at how psychedelics drive hallucinations, how psychedelics alter circuits in the brain that regulate anxiety. Animals can also show anxiety-like behavior. We're interested in how they influence cells in the brain, what they actually do, and how they change the structure and architecture of circuits and in individual cells. And I'm just going to tell you one tiny little story. Um, on psychedelics and mitochondria. And the person who actually did this work is right here on the front row, Dr. Sashena Fanibanda. So Sashena is a colleague of mine at TIFR, and we, uh, she and others in my lab and the group have actually worked on this. So what we stumbled upon, and literally stumbled upon, was the following. 
we found that serotonergic psychedelics change the number and the function of mitochondria. That's the bottom line. Now, why does this matter? Let me just explain this in a simple sense. Uh, anyone in South Mumbai aware of that power shortage we had a few days ago? We had a complete shutdown. It took a while for the power to come back. Okay, so this is what happens when you have a city like Mumbai, everybody is dying of hum humidity and heat has all decided to switch on all their air conditioners at the same time and has tripped some circuit and then everything goes haywire, right? This is pretty standard. We have forgotten what load shedding looks like because in Mumbai, especially in South Mumbai, we are rather privileged. Very rarely do we get like shutdowns for five hours or six hours. This is routine across our entire country. It's not surprising in most places to have like five hours of no power in the middle of the hot summer. That does happen, we have forgotten it in Mumbai. So the bottom line is you need electricity to provide you know, the ability to run all these machines and do the work of actually running these machines. And a city like Mumbai will have a lot of demands. Well, neurons in the brain eat up about 20% of the energy that you are consuming. So if you're eating food, 20% of whatever you're eating is going to fuel that one and a half kilogram mushy structure you have in your brain. It's a small structure, but eats up most of your energy. It's highly energy demanding um, little organ. Given that, you need to make sure that your power plants, which are mitochondria, are working optimally. You've got, them, got to have them really delivering all the energy that's required. And what is the energy currency for neurons? It's not electricity, it's ATP. It's a small chemical molecule. You break it down and you use it to do work. So you move things in the cell or you, you know, use your enzymes. That's what you're doing, physical work in the cell, which allows you to actually get the job done for the cell. Bottom line, because these cells are energy hungry, and they need optimally functioning mitochondria. The other big thing is that these cells don't die. Most of your neurons will be hanging around with you for the rest of your life, if you're lucky. Um, yeah, if you're all lucky, we will hold on to as many of them as we can. Unlike your skin, which you're gonna shed, and hopefully you're not shedding too much right now, but you're probably shedding a few skin cells for sure. Definitely turning over your bone, turning over your liver, unless you have done too much damage to it, hopefully not. But you're turning over most of your organs. You're replacing them. You can't replace most brain cells. Other than in few pockets, what you got, you got to keep because that's what's gonna hold you steady as long as you possibly can, right? So the, the demand on mitochondria is extremely high in the brain. And what we found is that molecules like DOI, first of all, increase growth factors in the brain. They also increase molecules that we know are important for making more mitochondria. And just to show you what they do, they produce more energy currency, ATP being the energy currency molecule. And here's the mitochondrial DNA content. This is what you have in your maternal lineage. You got it from your mom and her mom and, and all the way back to, you know, when we all left Africa. So all the way back there, right? So that's, that's how we traced our genetic uh, history. So mitochondrial DNA is, is something that goes up when, they are ex when neurons, cortical neurons, are exposed to this serotonergic psychedelic. Interestingly, it's not just psychedelics, it's also serotonin, it's also other drugs which are not psychedelics that target the same receptor. Bottom line, this is not, doesn't only happen in neurons in a dish, it happens in rats, where you can see the sim similar changes in the cortex. Lots of data here, just ignore it. The bottom line is you just end up with more mitochondria in the brain. And when you take out mitochondria and ask, how much energy or how effectively are they using the glucose that you have eaten and also the oxygen that you are breathing to burn the glucose to make the energy? How effectively are they doing that? Well, they're doing it a lot better when they have DOI on board. So you really increase the efficiency of these machines. It's like saying I'm building four new power plants in Mumbai and then I'm gonna work them at 100% efficiency. So it's gonna drive everything up to being far more functional. And this matters because it allows neurons to handle a whole bunch of enhanced energetic demands. All right, I'm gonna skip this. It also helps them survive a lot longer. So the, one of the findings for which we received the Infosys Prize was that we found that serotonergic psychedelics through the serotonin receptor, through an interesting molecular cascade, produce more mitochondria, allow you to protect neurons, change ATP levels, and actually allow you to buffer toxic molecules in the cell. I'm gonna end, and then we will migrate to the talk and chat part of the session. This is one of my creative students who decided that everybody in the lab needed to be photographed with a mushroom. 
we initially bought that white mushroom from uh, which we all cook and have mushroom bhaji with. It did not work. So she then decided to use her Photoshop skills and use that to, um, you know, yeah, well, we have a toadstool in this. So that's what we ended up with. And these are my collaborators. Without him, the work wouldn't be possible. And um, yeah, so acknowledgments to TIFR DAE, the PVF grant, India Alliance for funding two, two wonderful postdocs in my group, the Infosys Science Foundation, the Infosys Prize, and G5A in particular for allowing us to host this in this wonderful space. And then I'm gonna invite Priyanka to come up and we will chat because I think you might have lots of questions and I hope we can make this much more interactive and just uh, shoot the breeze with all sorts of questions you have about these molecules. I wanna end with one statement, which is to say that the greatest lesson we can take from indigenous practitioners is profound respect for molecules that are very potent and they do require legislation. They just require sensible, humane, considerate legislation that allows for the use of these molecules both for research, but also as therapeutic breakthroughs where they might be relevant. And in the absence of that, we will end up in states where we have already ended up, which is that we banned the mushroom mushrooms and ended up allowing nuclear warfare. So it's an interesting question for humanity to ask what would, how will we navigate this in the next 50 or 100 years that the younger generation certainly has to navigate. So I guess I can just go up there and, and ask Priyanka to join us.